Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar on Modern Nutrient Management in Forages. Tonight's webinar is co-hosted by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the Beef Cattle Research Council. I'm Tracy Herbert, your moderator tonight, and I'm the Extension Coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council. You and 170 other people from across the country registered, and just over half of the audience tonight is beef producers. So tonight's session will last for about one hour, and that'll include the question and answer period near the end. This webinar is being recorded, and I will email out the link to the recording um, earlier next week. And so if you miss hearing anything tonight and you want to watch it again, or if you know of some friends and neighbors who didn't hear about this in time, that uh, recording will be available to everyone that's interested. But I encourage you to also take some notes tonight as well, which is going to help you to remember some more of what you hear. So for those of you watching this live, rest assured that we can't hear or see you. If you want to communicate with us, what you need to do is type into the small chat window in the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have any questions or comments, that's the place to do it, and feel free to send in questions at any time. And if your internet connection is a little bit slow, um, what you can do is you can actually close the webcam window. So if you choose to close the webcams, um, then you won't be able to see us, but hopefully then the audio will come through a little bit more clearly and the slides will load a little bit faster for you if you do that. Um, and some, some exciting news and a first time for a BCRC webinar. Oh, just clicking my slide here. We've got a door prize thanks to Egg Canada. So for all of you producers joining in live right now, four of you will be randomly selected to receive a free copy of the book that you see on your screen there called Cool Forages, Advanced Management of Temperate Forages. And our guest speaker tonight is one of the people that put that book together. The lucky winners will receive an email from Bill Houston. Uh, so watch out for that. Bill works at the Egg Canada uh, office in Regina and so he'll just uh, need to ask you for your mailing address so he can put your copy uh, in the mail for you. And for anyone interested in more information on what's in that book or to order a copy if you're not one of the lucky winners, you can find that at farmwest.com. So our agenda tonight is pretty straightforward. Dr. Shabtai Bittman is our guest speaker and we'll give him and you a little bit of a break halfway through his presentation for some poll questions where you'll have a chance to answer some multiple choice questions on your screen. Then we'll open it up to questions from you and end things off by letting you know um, a few places to find some more information that would benefit you and your operation. So with that, I am pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Shabtai Bittman. Shabtai is currently one of the longest serving researchers at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. He began his career in the early 70s as a lecturer in plant ecology at McGill University and has since worked and studied forages in Nova Scotia, in Saskatchewan and in British Columbia. And BC is where he has spent his past 25 years and where he'll be speaking from tonight. Uh, his focus throughout his career has been to develop technologies to improve quantity and quality of forages according to ecological principles attaining, uh, attending to ecology, practicality, and environmental health of air and water. He's worked on several grasses, legumes, and silage corn for both dairy and beef industries and has received a merit award from the American Forage and Grassland Council. So please welcome Shabtai. Is it? Good? Sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much, Tracy. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity from the uh, uh, Canadian Cattlemen's Association. And uh, it's, it's just a great uh, opportunity to be able to talk to people across the country from here on the West Coast where the sun is still shining um, and the grass is growing, by the way. Uh, so it's, it's a great pleasure. Um, where do I start? Okay. Okay, so uh, Tracy, is this good? Yep, looks great. Okay, 
So uh, the subject of the uh, uh, talk today is, uh, as you know, is modern nutrient management in forages. And I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Derek Hunt, who has been my coworker for uh, uh, the entire time at Ian Agassiz. And I'd only wish he was with me all the other years I was working, except he's much too young to have been able to do that. So um, the, yeah, modern nutrient management in forages is going to be really two parts of the presentation. Uh, kind of a, a general discussion about nutrient management and what it means and, and, uh, and information we gathered about the cattle industry in Canada. And uh, that will be the first part. Uh, the second part, uh, I, I didn't know we're having the cool forages as the door prize, but uh, it, it's kind of going to be a, a sort of an infomercial about, uh, about that book where we'll be covering a, a number of the chapters and, and giving you a little bit of the uh, flavor and the information that you can find in the book as a, as a way of uh, uh, as a way of introducing the very subjects, uh, there are uh, it's such a big topic, nutrient management, that of course there's no possibility of covering all these uh, all the different topics in one hour. So uh, the overall theme is going to be our forages green, and uh, uh, of course by green we we have this uh, this uh, double meaning, and uh, for the for the public and 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 for people out there, you know, the, the importance of forages, they don't often, uh, they, they oftentimes don't realize how much a part of the landscape uh, forages are and the livestock sector is really, and uh, it's part of what uh, we accept as, uh, as the beauty of our, of our surroundings and certain countries are actually dominated by forages or parts of countries. And uh, it's also part of our art. And, uh, so here are two pieces of art. Uh, one is, uh, is an installation in, uh, recently built in Vienna, Austria. And it shows, uh, obviously, grasses on the side of the building with a cow on top. Uh, it's by Armin Garino. And the other one is a uh, much more famous uh, uh, painter, uh, Vincent van Gogh, of course, and uh, Haystacks in Provence in, in uh, France. So uh, it's part of our landscape, and it's part of our art and it's part of our consciousness. And I really like this quotation, which I got from somewhere, although I can't actually remember where it was exactly. But it was a book uh, by a Dutch artist. And it said something like, uh, the rural uh, farm landscape in Holland without livestock is boring. And uh, yeah, I think that, uh, that, that says a lot about the um, importance of forages and the livestock sector in particular, the cattle sector is uh, for uh, for the overall uh, sense of the of the landscape. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about the ecosystem, the agricultural ecosystem, to begin with. And so this is a very simplified uh, diagram that shows um, the inputs into our agricultural ecosystem. So in terms of nitrogen, we have uh, fertilizer produced. Uh, Chemically, we have nitrogen fixation from, from legumes, uh, whether it's uh, alfalfa or other forages, or it could be uh, pulse crops. And then they come into the crop, and then the crop goes into the livestock, and the, the waste goes back to the crop, and out of it you get protein and food. And this is a, a system that we well recognize. Okay. Um, so here, here's the issue. Uh, this is uh, a kind of very simple model that explains uh, some of the uh, interesting and challenging, perplexing issues about nutrient management in any system. So this system could be the soil, it could be a whole farm, it could be a region, it could be almost anything. There's two key things. It's, a, it's called a leaky pipe concept. So uh, you have a pipe and it's leaky, and you have inputs, which are either fertilizer or manure, and you have the production on the other end. So there's two really important aspects to this very simple model. And when we think of our work, we're always coming back to this rather simple idea. One is that if, you, if your inputs exceed your outputs, you will get leakages because the, the, the surplus will have to go somewhere. And that could, those, those, um, those losses could be as ammonia into the atmosphere, as nitrogen gas. It could be nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. It could be leaching runoff. So if you exceed your inputs, exceed your outputs, then you're in that situation where you're going to get losses. And that's uh, usually a situation where you have very intensive production. 
So there's a challenge to know how much input you need not to exceed your output. The other side of the story is this, that if you got leaks, you're, uh, you're not going to benefit fully from all your inputs. So you need to find ways to address the leakages in the system so that you will get as much of your inputs showing up in your outputs. So those are the uh, two things that need, one needs to keep in mind. So you need to address issues like ammonia loss or leaching losses in order to be able to benefit from the nutrients. So this is how we see things. Okay, this is our concept from a research standpoint and from a farmer standpoint. But this is what society sees. Okay, and I'll take you through this a little bit. It's, it's actually not that complicated. Um, it's referred to now, uh, it's got this name of uh, reactive nitrogen cascade. It's a, it's a term that's been coined uh, in the States. It's caught on worldwide and it's very much the focus of a lot of research and a lot of activity all over the world. Uh, it, based maybe mostly out of Europe, but the Americans are really catching on to this and it's even spreading to, uh, to South America and to Africa. So the reactive nitrogen cascade. So what is reactive nitrogen? That's basically almost every form of nitrogen except the N2 gas in the atmosphere, which tends to be very unreactive, it's very stable. And all the other forms, they change from one form to another. And the idea of the cascade is that one atom of nitrogen can change forms, chemical forms, as it's going through the system, and each time it changes forms, it may do something else, positive or negative, in the system. Okay, so this is our system from the agricultural standpoint. Okay, these are our inputs, as before. And right away from the farm, we can have denitrification, uh, which is just the conversion of nitrogen from fertilizer and from soil and from manure into nitrogen gas. It goes into the atmosphere, it doesn't do any harm, but it's a loss. Nitrous oxide can be emitted. That's a, a greenhouse gas. It has effects on uh, transferred ozone, nitrous nitrogen oxides, also an ozone issue. And then let's take a look at ammonia, which is one of the major laws you'll see in a minute. And so what ammonia, what happens with ammonia is it goes into the atmosphere and it may react with, um, are, are they seeing this? No, they shouldn't see this. We're no, no, we're fine. Yeah, so the ammonia gas reacts with um, acid gas, ammonia is a basic gas, it reacts with acid gas as it come from industry, from transport, and it forms these foreign particulates, and these particulates have health implications, you'll see in a minute, and also they get deposited in natural ecosystems. In the natural ecosystems, it can cause eutrophication, which means, anyway, negative effects on these ecosystems, acidification, and uh, then all that nitrogen can wind up running off into waterways, it can even convert back into N2 or nitrous oxide. And then, of course, you have all the losses that may happen into the uh, ecosystem, uh, into the hydrosphere as opposed to the atmosphere, as nitrate uh, leached through the soil or uh, as runoff. Okay. And the one positive thing is the food that we get, of course. It's uh, no small thing. It's, uh, but the nutrients in the food in themselves, in our human ecosystem, also are potential pollutants. So the, this is the system as it is, a, a, a picture of it in, in terms of reactive nitrogen that reflects what the public might be seeing. Okay, and we need to be aware of what it is that the world out there sees and how we can take care of business as best as we can uh, to, to uh, mitigate any of the negative effects. So. Just to give you an idea of our numbers, this isn't about the cattle industry, this is agriculture in Canada. And the few numbers I want to point out is uh, we have the two sources of nitrogen uh, into our system, ecosystem, into our agricultural ecosystem. We have fertilizer and then fixation. And unlike a lot of other countries uh, that don't use as much legumes as we do, uh, we have actually a little bit more nitrogen coming in from, from biological fixation as opposed to fertilizer. So it's a very, very, very important uh, sources. You have uh, exports as plant and livestock material. And then you have the, uh, the losses as uh, denitrification 
um, and that's ammonia here, okay, mainly from manure, but also from fertilizer, and also uh, runoff and leaching. So the, the losses into, the, uh, into water are almost as high as the ammonia, or to put it another way, the ammonia actually is, losses are actually a little bit more than all the, water, all the losses to water, and on top of that, you also have denitrification. And uh, you have some of the uh, nitrogen that's actually deposited from the atmosphere because of uh, lightning effects or because there is reactive nitrogen already there and it's, uh, it comes down as rainwater. So these are some, just to give you an idea of some of the numbers, uh, basically um, the amount that's exported from the farm is, om is equal to, let's say, almost half of, uh, or about half of all the uh, nitrogen that's import imported as either natural biological fixation or fertilizer. So this gives you an idea about some of the magnitudes. Okay, so uh, what are people saying about all this? So here's a study uh, that's been recently published, and what they did was they looked at the negative effects, the positive and negative effects of using nitrogen uh, in, in uh, agricultural systems. So the benefits are the export of agricultural products from the United States. And uh, the revenue is shown here state by state. Okay, and you can see some states benefit a lot uh, from, especially California, from the use of nitrogen. On the other side is the cost. What are the costs? For this study, the cost was the health effects of the fine particles that are formed when ammonia reacts with these acid, gas, acid gases. And so they determined the health effects versus the revenue. They found two things. One is that the, where you benefit is different geographically from where you pay the, the cost, the burden of the health effects. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily happen in the same place because ammonia travels long distances in the atmosphere. And overall, the food exports were worth about two times what the, premature, what the cost of premature mortality, what they estimate the cost of premature mortality. And that's, that's the gross export value. So um, one may question the study. Um, it's one study. But the thing I wanted to point out, that if you think it's trivial, it's published by Harvard University, which means a lot of people are going to take this very seriously. And as a result of studies like this and others, we get newspaper articles, London Times, Reuters, I chose these two because they're dominant sources of information for the community at large. And what they're saying is that we should encourage the reduction of consumption of meat products. And top of the list is, is beef. And so they're saying that we can benefit a lot environmentally by eating and less, beef, less meat and especially less beef. So uh, these are, this is what's out there. I'm sure most of you know about this. Uh, but I think that we need to lay the groundwork for why it is that we need to pay attention uh, to uh, nutrient management, why it's so important uh, for the overall sustainability of the industry. So we wanted to understand what the um, various uh, agricultural sectors were in Canada. And um, we did a survey in 2005, 2006 uh, to look at all the different sectors. And I'll present a few numbers from the beef cattle uh, part of the survey. And so first of all, uh, we looked at how we estimated how much uh, nitrogen was excreted uh, by beef cattle. Uh, so we broke it down by region, and we broke it down by uh, classes of uh, beef cattle, a cow, a calf, uh, by environment, by stats count, calf is up to one year old, um, and so on. And you can see that the total amount of, of nitrogen in manure in Canada was 634,000 tons of nitrogen. Okay, and that's, um, so that's the total amount. Now, so then what we did was we looked at uh, where all this ended up on the farm. So importantly, so here's the total amount of 634, and we found that about half of it, slightly over half, was deposited directly on pasture. Okay, and of that, because the emissions, the, the ammonia losses from pastures are actually quite low, then um, that which is retained on pasture was uh, almost half of what was excreted on the pasture. I'll have a little more to say about that later. But now compare that with uh, what happens with 
uh, that which is excreted in confinement, which is somewhat less than half. And because there are all these losses, there are losses from confinement, there's losses from storage, and there's losses after land application. So what, what is retained on the land is, um, is about half of what was actually uh, deposited on the land. And the loss, overall loss of, of just from ammonia was 27% of all the nitrogen that uh, was excreted by, by beef cattle. So that just gives you an idea of some of the um, numbers that, um, that, uh, that we estimated from the 2005-2006 survey. Uh, overall, uh, so this is the, yeah, the overall 634 was excreted. 170 was lost as ammonia, and that's 27% of the total. So we also uh, wanted to see uh, something about the changes in farming practices. And we, in 2012, we surveyed farms, again, not the same farms, but a similar cohort of farms, uh, over 1,000 across the country, and uh, to look at how farming practices uh, were in 2012 and how they might have changed from uh, our 2005 survey when, of course, uh, the industry was very much afflicted by BSC. So uh, just uh, some nu beef nutrient industry fa farm facts, some fun facts in a way. So one of the things was, uh, so this is the number of responses. Um, the number of responses, 200, 322 in this case. So what we found of the people that said that they had uh, alfalfa and other legumes in their pasture stand, uh, they, they estimated 22% of their pasture uh, forage was actually uh, legume, probably alfalfa in most cases. And, the, and this was similar uh, for the percentage tame and pasture. Uh, uh, oh, okay, sorry, this is, I was, it was blocked for a minute for me. So this is the percentage of tame and pasture uh, tame pasture that was manured was about 13%, and fertilized with chemical fertilizer was about 13%. Of the fertilizer that was used, mostly it was uh, urea, 4600. So why is that important? Because urea emits a lot of ammonia, and it's very difficult in forage systems to prevent that from happening. And it used to be that there was a lot more ammonium nitrate. In Quebec, they still use calcium ammonium nitrate. Uh, but in most of Canada, we use urea or UAN. And it's a, it's a potential source of uh, emissions and loss. Okay, so just just some some facts, uh, some interesting uh, um, numbers. But o and overall, when nitrogen fertilizer was applied, it was applied about 50 kilograms per hectare. Um, so now um, some other uh, things more related uh, to manure. Uh, the fraction that did soil test before landing uh, before application of manure, there was uh, less than 18 percent. It's a fraction, not a percentage. And the fraction that in uh, three years had chemical analyzed chemical analysis soil cloud manure was less than five percent. And uh, this this was the kind of analysis that the uh, that was reported. And what's interesting is that knowing uh, what manure should uh, cattle manure should test test at, these numbers are probably correct. So those people that uh, presented this data was only a very small number, less than 10 percent of, uh, of the, uh, uh, actually less, uh, closer to 1 percent of the people that were surveyed actually knew that those that knew actually did have the right numbers. Maybe they looked it up uh, when they were doing the survey. Uh, now, I just wanted to point this other uh, piece of information. So we asked farmers uh, um, about how much time they thought their cattle on pasture would spend gathered around uh, kind of loafing areas or um, you know water areas or uh, uh, camping areas they call it in some countries and uh, the estimates uh, both in 2012 and in uh, 2006 were very similar and they're very similar across the country at about 22 to 24 percent of the time so why is that important uh, it points to an issue um, on the one hand, um, it's very nice that fertilize that the manure uh, in uh, that's deposited on pastures very little of it is lost into the atmosphere. So that suggests a very efficient, very green uh, aspect to grazing. But unfortunately, it's not so well distributed on the pastures as we know, and there tends to be a, a movement of nutrients from where the cattle are moving around to where they tend to camp. 
And so if they spend 24% of their time, uh, one quarter of the time in these camping areas, it may be that 25% uh, of or 24% of the nutrients that they collected from the entire farm now winds up in these areas where it isn't going to do much good because it's probably going to be way too much nutrients. So the spatial distribution of pastures is, is a real concern and as a spatial distribution in all sorts of things. And it's just something that needs to be remembered when we think about our systems. So just a couple of points about things. There are a lot of things that didn't change that much, which is nice for us because um, it validated that our methodology was consistent across the two surveys because we didn't ask the same farmers and, and sometimes it would change the wording a little bit. And there were a great many things that uh, we actually got very, very similar percentages. Uh, the percentage of farmers that harvest once uh, as opposed to twice, very, very similar results, or more than twice in a year. Um, the uh, ratio in the east versus the west for a covered versus uncovered hay and, uh, and things like that. So this is very nice. There are a lot of practices that didn't change, but one practice that did change, as we know, was increased winter feeding. And so uh, that's mainly changed on the prairies. This is the ratio of farms that summer graze that also uh, that would winter graze. So in 2006, maybe 25% uh, of farmers that uh, summer graze also winter graze, but it was closer to 50% in 2012. Okay, so almost half the farmers that summer grazed also winter grazed. And there was also an increase in the boreal shield area, which is kind of the northern parts of the eastern part of the country. Uh, there was only a very slight increase in eastern Canada. And I noticed uh, today that there is going to be a research grant uh, given to the University of Dalhousie to look at ways of, in, of increasing farmer interest in eastern Canada, Atlantic Canada, in winter uh, raising actually, it should be this region here, Atlantic Canada, in, in uh, trying to use this technology, which came from uh, uh, from Western Canada, developed, I think, originally by uh, an old colleague of mine, Dwayne McCartney. So that's the first part of my talk. I uh, don't know how long I've taken. How long have I taken? Oh. Um, so the next part is going to be about our book. And it's going to be a little bit of an infomercial, and we're going to tell you about what, what information we have in there and some tidbits of things that, uh, that might be of interest, okay? So should we go into the question period, the polling? Sure. We can take a break for some audience participation. But thank God it's all there. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't do this. <laughs> you haven't just been talking to yourself, no. Okay. So poll questions. So uh, also for anyone who is on Twitter and wants to participate, you can um, tweet during our webinar using the hashtag #BeefWebinar. And we have got five poll questions for you. So um, what's going to happen? I'm going to launch a multiple choice question onto the screen. You'll click on your answer, and then we'll all see the results together. And your answers to poll questions like these are anonymous to everyone else that's on the line. So our first question for you is okay from your perspective which is a challenge for nutrient management grazing confined feeding extensive winter feeding or other so which is challenging when managing nutrients go ahead and click on your answers I'll give you about five seconds and then uh, then we'll all see the results together Okay, let's see the results. Okay, 58% of you said confined feeding, 34% said extensive winter feeding, 16% said grazing, and then 5% said another aspect of the beef sector is challenging when managing nutrients. Okay, next question. Um, is whether you currently have an operational nutrient management plan in place. So only if you keep records on what you're doing uh, does that qualify as a yes to this question. If you kind of have a plan in your head and you know what you're doing, um, but you're not really keeping records, then then uh, select no for this question. 
See, do you currently have an operational nutrient management plan in place on your operation? Okay, let's see. So 13% of you said yes. Okay, our third question for you. Uh, is which is your largest barrier to adopting nutrient management plans or practices? Is time the biggest roadblock? Uh, is it more on the financial side? Is it your knowledge around these practices and plans or something else? So which is your largest barrier? Go ahead and click on your answer and I'll give you just a few more seconds to get those in. Okay, let's see the results. So for most of you, the largest barrier is knowledge and understanding about these plans and practices. Um, time at 19%, as well as other, and then finances um, at 16%. Next question is, which components of nutrient management research are most important to you? So which of the following do you feel that, you know, research and gaining more understanding about is more important to you? So we're not necessarily talking about communicating about these things or getting extension information out, but conducting research. So environmental impacts and solutions, agronomic and economic feasibility, doing more research on social concerns or something else. Which area of research is most important to you? See a few more votes coming in. Okay, let's see. Okay, 57% of you said agronomic or economic feasibility, and 40% of you said environmental impacts and solutions, and then 3% at other. And our final question for you tonight is we're wondering where do you get most of your information to make nutrient management decisions? Is it from environmental farm plans? Is it from government resources? So maybe um, government employed extension specialists or the field days that they put on or their websites or alternatively industry resources, maybe provincial cattlemen's groups uh, or industry magazines and publications. Is it your neighbors or somewhere else? So I guess tonight is both government and industry since we're co-hosting tonight, but where do you normally get your information? Just give you a few more seconds to get those in. Okay, let's see the results. Okay, most of you said from government resources at 52%. Uh, 45% of you said industry. 26% of you said environmental farm plans. Six of you said from your neighbors. And then 13% said other. So that's it for poll questions. And so we'll hand it back over to Shabtai to finish up his presentation. Thanks, Tracy. And that was uh, actually pretty neat. That was nifty. So I'm going to talk to you about our book, uh, Cool Forages, and some of the context, uh, contents and uh, contexts as well. So uh, Cool Forages, Advanced Management of Temperate uh, Forages. And uh, so uh, it wouldn't be an infomercial if we didn't have some, uh, uh, some uh, supporting uh, uh, statements from people. Uh, so, uh, and because we're Canadian, we don't really want any Canadians' uh, endorsements. We only want American endorsements or national endorsements. So uh, here are some of the ones that we got from, uh, um, that I had picked. I didn't take any of the negative ones. You can't see those. Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, what people are saying about it, and that's why we're excited. And so there are many chapters in, in the book. Uh, and I'm just going to focus on the nutrient uh, chapters, not all of them, but a few of them, just to uh, give you a taste and some, some tidbits of information uh, from these various uh, chapters, or some of these chapters. Okay. So um, there's a chapter from, uh, actually from Wisconsin and, and Minnesota uh, by Bill Chokola 
and Michael Roussel. Uh, Michael Roussel just retired. Um, and it's about the benefits of uh, perennial forages in rotation. And a lot of, they've done a lot of work over there. And you can see one of their um, uh, graphs from the chapter. And it shows how um, uh, following corn after uh, forages, in their case alfalfa, and how much uh, higher yield they would get uh, even if they put a lot of fertilizer nitrogen, but actually don't need very much fertilizer. But the effect lasts, it lasts more than one year, but it's, the strongest effect is in the first year. By the second year, uh, the effect is, is uh, not as uh, strong. So uh, I, this is a, a chapter which goes into a great deal of depth about uh, rotations of forages um, with, uh, with other crops and, and the benefits. But uh, forages, uh, with all their benefits, are leaky systems. And here you can see, actually see the leaks. Uh, so this is uh, from my picture uh, and the chapter by Michael Roussel. And it's an alfalfa stand. And you can see smoke coming out. And where's the smoke coming out from? It's coming out because it was uh, pumped into the tile drainage system. And it's coming out through macropores or wormholes or cracks in the soil. And it shows kind of in reverse uh, how, the, uh, how you have uh, pathways for uh, nutrients or pathogens or whatever it is uh, through the soil to wind up into, uh, in this case, into tile drainage systems. So I thought that was a, a really neat way to uh, portray this. And this is an alfalfa stand. Uh, so you can see that in some cases there's a real big concern with perennial crops when there's cracks in the soil and there's wormholes. And this is shown here. Uh, this is actually not from the book. This is from our previous book, uh, which I'm not going to promote here. Um, but this is on silage, uh, corn silage. And it shows these peaks of uh, phosphorus coming out of the tile drain system after injection of manure. And this happens, this is actually in, in hours after application. And you can see that the, uh, it doesn't take very long sometimes for the manure to show up in the tile drain systems because of these macropores, because of these large pores or openings or cracks in the soil. And so uh, that's, you can have a very protective system, but this, the protective system could have cracks in it. So we did a long-term study at Agassiz. This is a, a view uh, of one of our research areas. That's not in the background. And uh, we did it. We we're actually still doing it. It's a long-term uh, manure trial. We've uh, run it now for about 20 years. And we wanted to see how much of the nitrogen is really from the manure is actually taken out by the crop. So you, you can't really do this in short-term trials because a lot of the, man, the manure nitrogen is not readily available, but half is not. It's in organic form. And the only way you're really going to be able to measure how, uh, how much of that is going to be available is by repeating the trial in kind of constant conditions year after year after year so that the legacy nitrogen can start to kick in in, in, in all its, uh, it, it fully kick in uh, after, after a number of years. So we were able to do this evaluation and uh, we compared fertilizer under low, what we call low and high rates. Uh, the intensity production is much higher here uh, than in many parts of Canada. And our production is, is quite a bit higher. We take, uh, in this trial, four cuts of grass. Some of the farmers actually will take five cuts of grass, occasionally even six. So what we see is that the end recovered by the crop with fertilizer is about 60, 65 percent, depending on, on the application rate. And this is over uh, a period of about 10 years in this case. And then when we look at manure, we see that only about 40 percent of the manure nitrogen is recovered in the crop. So even allowing for that organic nitrogen to become available over a great deal of time, uh, we still don't get nearly the, the same amount of nitrogen recovered from the manure as we do from fertilizer. And sometimes this is referred to as uh, uh, the fertilizer replacement value of uh, manure, which is never 100%. And this is a treatment where we alternated manure and fertilizer. And actually, it turned out to be a very effective treatment for us. I won't get into a lot of detail. but um, in terms of uh, what was left in the soil, so we were able to do this because it's a long-term trial. A lot of if they're short-term trials, you can't really do this uh, because the effect in each year is just too small to be able to pick it up. But we found that about 
um, of the total uh, applied nitrogen was actually still left in the soil in this forage system. Okay, there hadn't been any cultivation in that period of time. And so about 40% was recovered, 30% was left in the soil, and about 30%, uh, let's say, uh, was unaccounted for. Unaccounted for is another way of saying loss. Uh, whereas in the, for, in the fertilizer system, we had less re retained in the soil, but uh, also the unaccounted for was less, okay, especially uh, with the low fertilizer application. So we uh, estimated or inferred from some of the other work that we did where most of this nitrogen was going. And we think that from fertilizer, most of that lost nitrogen is leached out of the system. But we see less leaching with manure than we do with fertilizer. So where could that have gone? And the answer is at least in part uh, volatilization as ammonia from the atmosphere. This is despite the fact that in this trial we used, it was liquid manure, it was liquid dairy manure, and we applied it with a low emission applicator. So we didn't inject it into the soil, but we applied the surface band of it, which is known to reduce emissions by about 50%. So even reducing the ammonia emissions by 50%, what it would have been if we just sprayed it on with a typical splash plate, and we have our own data and other people's data that show that we can save about 50% by using these uh, surface banding, slay foot, uh, or sliding shoe, or trailing shoe, it goes by different names. Uh, even despite that, we still find that we uh, get these, uh, these higher uh, losses. So there's, there's still work to be done to improve the efficacy of, of manure, and we're working on that. We won't get into all these different, uh, all these different technologies, but there's certainly something that we've worked on and we've made some improvements. So uh, another source of loss is uh, when you renovate. And we shouldn't uh, forget about that because in a lot of the uh, uh, forest systems, uh, they have to be renovated every so often. In our case here, probably every five, four, five, six, seven years, the field will be renovated. And so uh, when you renovate uh, by plowing, then you release a lot of nitrate into the soil. That's in, the, that's in the chapter, of course. And this is from the manure, and this is from the fertilized plot. So you get more nitrogen released from the manure, and that's not surprising because we know that we stack that soil with more nitrogen. So, so that's reflected in the fact. But what's really interesting here also is that, of course, another way to renovate is to spray with Roundup. And so here's when we uh, apply the treatment either by tillage or by just spraying Roundup no tillage. And sure enough, it didn't take very long, and we start seeing emission, uh, in this case, nitrate in the soil uh, building up even just after the application, even after the application of uh, uh, of the Roundup, so uh, you get release, and this is what would have happened, or what did happen when we didn't do anything. So there's some amount of nitrogen that, uh, nitrate that's released, but it's very very low uh, compared to what we did when we terminated the stand. So we have losses, and there's all kinds of losses, and one that's been kind of ignored until recently and uh, there's been some really interesting work done in Quebec and in uh, Finland and some other areas you see we've done a little bit ourselves and that is uh, losses in the winter time so uh, we, our winter scene doesn't look like this but this is what things look like in Quebec in Finland and in much of Canada besides Quebec and uh, you can see here this is the soil temperature at 5 degrees uh, sorry 5 centimeters depth 2 inches deep and you've got a bunch of snow cover and even though the soil is frozen here, you're still getting emissions of nitrous oxide, and nitrous oxide is released by bacteria. So even though the soil is frozen, the bacteria are still releasing nitrous oxide. They're still active. Okay, and that's really interesting. So how can the bacteria be active when the soil is frozen? Well, because even though uh, the soil is frozen, and that means that the water in the soil is frozen. It doesn't mean all of the water in the soil is frozen. So some of the water in the soil is bound to clay particles. And because it's bound to clay particles, it doesn't form ice crystals. And therefore, it doesn't actually freeze. And so that, that water is cold, and it may be less than zero, but it's not frozen. And so what they found was that in clay soils, in fine texture soils like clay soils, they would get more. They would have this microbial activity, which they didn't see in their sandy soils, uh, because 
the sandy soils don't tie up that water as much, and so it tends to more of the water tends to freeze. There's very little unfrozen water at sub-zero temperature. Another thing that's really interesting is this spike here. So here is when you get a thaw, and when you get a thaw, this has been shown over and over again, uh, all of a sudden you get a spike in nitrous oxide emissions. There's all kinds of theories for why that is. I don't know if I believe any of them myself, uh, but the, it, there's no denying that you see this, and we've seen it here and other places. So uh, this is our own studies here in terms of wintertime emissions of nitrous oxide. And you see, what I want to show you is that some years it's actually pretty low. But then suddenly you get a year, like 2010, 2011, where the conditions were just so, and we had quite a lot of nitrous oxide emissions in the wintertime. This is in the wintertime. Okay, it's, it's not frozen most of this time, but it's pretty close to zero, and it doesn't look like a whole lot of things are going on. Everything looks pretty dead and static, and, uh, but it's not. And these emissions here at 2 um, kilograms per hectare for that period of time is actually pretty high uh, for emissions of nitrous oxide. So we were able to confirm that. And uh, when we talk okay, when we talk about uh, wintertime losses, we shouldn't forget about runoff. And runoff is an important loss of nutrients even on uh, fairly flat soils, and, uh, and so this is uh, work that we did. We applied nutrient, actually, manure in the fall, and what we found was if we uh, aerated the soil, we could reduce the runoff, and we could reduce the runoff of water, and we could reduce uh, solids, and we could reduce uh, a reactive P that's, that, that's running off the field. And this is a, in a high rain year, and this is in a low rain year. And uh, really, it's the amount of rain that happens in a week or so, in a few days, in a week or so, uh, after the manure is applied, the mix that has the most uh, effect on the amount of runoff that happens. So if you can avoid that rain in the first, well, if, if you happen to be lucky enough to avoid that rain in the next uh, couple of weeks, two or three weeks, then you'll get less runoff is what we, we found in our trials. So when we're talking about runoff, we're talking about phosphorus in a lot of cases. Um, and we have a very nice chapter in here from Grant Kowalenko, who recently retired uh, on phosphorus and interpreting phosphorus. It's actually a very interesting subject. There's been a lot of wonderful work done in the University of Manitoba, in the Hydrology Institute in Saskatchewan, and other places um, on uh, the runoff issues, the phosphorus issues, and contaminating uh, water in uh, Canada. Um, I think in the U.S., its EPA has designated phosphorus in surface water to be the biggest environmental issue connected with agriculture. It exceeds air quality issues and exceeds nitrate in groundwater. Uh, it's their biggest issue. And I think in many parts of, uh, of Canada it's, it's likewise. So, so there's a nice article uh, which describes, uh, here's a risk index that uh, Grant uh, developed using different types of soil tests, uh, which is quite innovative, and, uh, and how it, would, how it uh, uh, as how it rated BC soils across different ecoregions in BC. So um, Grant also wrote a nice article on sulfur, and sulfur uh, is sort of an up-and-coming nutrient. It used to be nobody. Well, on the prairies, we've always on the prairies, sulfur has always been known about, like for decades now. Not always, but for decades, people have known the issue of sulfur deficiency. A lot of other areas where there's been a lot of sulfur deposition from the atmosphere because of, of, contamin you know, of the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, there was a lot of free sulfur and when the air has been cleaned with your sulfur uh, limits have been put on, on fuels in particular, there's less sulfur deposition and suddenly you're getting places that never have sulfur deficiency. These lighter areas here have uh, been determined to be, in the, the South Alpha Ontario, have been determined to be uh, sulfur uh, deficient areas. Okay, so the problem with sulfur, I mean, the good thing is it's cheap. Uh, the bad thing is that the soil tests are not very good. They're only indicative. They're not really, uh, they're not fully developed yet. And the symptoms look exactly like nitrogen. So you wouldn't know if you have sulfur deficiency or nitrogen deficiency just by looking at the crop. And this suggests a need for, uh, and the benefits for on-farm trials. And I mention that here because I'm going to get to that at the very end of the talk as my final point. Okay, so this, it would be, be very nice to do strips of sulfur application here and to determine, to validate 
if this is indeed sulfur and how much more yield you can get and so on. So another aspect which is interesting in, these, uh, in this nutrient world, uh, this is a study that, uh, that I was involved in that, that we did at Melford when I was there in Saskatchewan. And we looked at the issue of uh, fertilizer or nutrient imbalances. And there was nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And what we found was that sure enough, if you just applied nitrogen, you would bump up yield, and this is the yield. But if you bumped up nitrogen, without bumping up phosphorus and sulfur, and this is over uh, five years and it's five different locations. Okay, so it's quite, quite an extensive trial on community pastures. So when we bumped up nitrogen without bumping up phosphorus and sulfur, what we got was that the fine grasses, which in this case was probably Kentucky bluegrass to a lesser extent creek and red fescue, over, it became more dominant relative to the coarse grasses. Okay, so uh, there was kind of a switch uh, you see in the back on the, uh, uh, the zero treatment, you had uh, 35, 36, and here suddenly you get a whole, you get less legumes, and you also get um, uh, you, you also get a lot more of these lower yielding fine grasses, and the ones that are, they tend to be less water, um, uh, drought resistant because they have shallow root system and so on. So there's the ratio that you can see here. Now if you put the uh, if you put the phosphorus back into the equation, then you get, you see how you reverse that ratio between here and here. You reverse the ratio just by putting a little bit of phosphorus into the system. And now if you put sulfur into the system, then now you've really bumped up the nice coarse grass. In this case, it was mainly uh, smooth brown, probably a little bit of quack grass, but it was mainly smooth brown grass. That, uh, so it, it shows the importance of having and a nice balance of nutrients. Um, I don't have that here, but an interesting finding that we had uh, with a couple of studies that we did in, in uh, Malford when I was there is that these forbs that we think of as weeds, you know, they're the, uh, you know, the daddy lines and the northern bed straw and uh, yarrow and, and all the stuff that's, um, it actually had a, a better uh, copper to molybdenum ratio than the grasses did. So there were some benefits to the animal grazing on this, on having more forbs. And controlling them was not necessarily a good thing from the animal nutrition standpoint. On these pastures, that tended to have an excess of molybdenum relative to copper. So that's on the slide. There's a chapter, oh, and that, that is referenced. To, that there is a, a little small article in the book about that. So here's a, a nice article by Ken Smith, also recently retired. David Chadwick, not, not retired. Uh, and this is on, on, min, on um, manure analysis, and uh, particularly on solid manure, and the issues of uh, reducing losses from stacks, and the importance of it shows the importance of neat stacks versus messy stacks in terms of maintaining nutrients. But there's also some very innovative techniques for sampling and analyzing uh, solid manure, uh, which they've done in the UK. So my last. Um, article uh, that I'm going to refer to, and I won't get into a lot of detail on this. I just want to pique your interest about this. So there is a, a website that uh, Derek uh, and I have developed. Derek is certainly the lead on this. And um, it's called nloss.ca. And what it does and what it will do as we continue to develop it is give farmers a real-time tool for managing their nitrogen. So you can access this on your cell phone in a field. You can input. Uh, your uh, soil conditions, they remain uh, confidential and uh, they, they can remain on the system so you don't have to keep entering that. You put in your, ag your agronomic information. In our case, so far we just have corn on this, but we're going to do a lot more crops. And uh, you can put in your planting date, how much manure, fertilizer, when you've done it, so on and so on. It automatically takes the weather data for the weather station that you pick. Um, and you can have your own weather station even on your farm that it'll collect if, it, if it's down, the data is downloadable, or uploadable, I should say, then you can actually collect that data into this, into this application. And you can actually see on any given day where the nitrogen is in your field, how much is in the crop, how much is in the soil, what form it is, what risk there is of leaching, how much has been lost by ACS losses. And you can actually check this on any given day of the year, uh, winter, summer. And so this is an application I just wanted you to, to know about. So my final uh, point is really a discussion point. I think we're facing issues uh, with uh, getting information for farmers 
Um, there's not as much research activity uh, as there used to be. Um, I can tell you over the 35 years I've worked in the system, 35 plus years, there are a lot fewer of me around and I don't expect that when I'm gone that my position will be re restaffed. There's no indication that it will be. Um, so uh, there's generally um, a decline in this type of work in the government and I think also at the university level because uh, uh, you have to be realistic that when faculty are, are hired at universities, uh, they're under a lot of pressure uh, to produce a very highly technical papers in high impact, scientific impact journals, or they won't get tenure. They won't get funding, uh, and their career will stall. So uh, they're under a lot of competition to do the kind of work which is very high level work, and not to invest as much of their time and energy into practical work, for which there's very little funding anyway, let's be honest. So um, what does this leave us? Well, it's not desperate. Um, there's a lot more interest in farmer-driven research around the world. It's not just here. Um, I know that there's a big program in Sweden, for example, in trying to promote this. And uh, it so happens that the BC Forage Council now has a, a project which is funded uh, through going forward, I believe, um, to develop a manual for uh, helping farmers to develop their on-farm uh, uh, research projects. So if there is a chance, uh, if, if you're interested, I would be happy to discuss this point. Um, it's, it's not, uh, for me, a political issue. It's just how do we go forward from here in coming up with information that farmers need on, on farms. Uh, and even if, you, even if uh, research were to continue at the same level on, at uh, research facilities, universities, there's still a great many parts of the country that are not well served by these areas because they're just too far away. So it's, uh, it's really important that the sector and the producers and advisors, the industry, seed industry, the fertilizer industry, whoever, work together in developing these, uh, these farmer-driven or, or sector-driven research projects in, in a good and sound and interesting way. So that's it. I really appreciate your time. Some of you guys, uh, I guess, in the, on the East Coast must be ready for, for bed and you're probably drinking wine and uh, having a scotch. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Shabtai. Um, yeah, nutrient management is certainly a tricky topic to try to cover in less than an hour, but you've really highlighted some really interesting things that we can keep thinking about and take some time to, um, to do some research on our own and, and learn more about whether it be in the book or elsewhere with other government or industry resources or what have you. But So now um, we are going to open it up to questions from the audience. I have to get myself organized here. Okay, so again, uh, for those of you wanting to ask questions, please type them into the chat box on the side of your screen. If your control panel has closed, you should see an orange arrow near the top. Click on that arrow, it'll expand again, and then you'll see the box to type your question into. Uh, your questions here are anonymous as well. I'm just going to read them out. So we've got, got a couple in already. Uh, first one being, what would you recommend as the first steps to creating and implementing a nutrient management plan for our farms? Okay, so um, there, there are different, there are, can you hear me? Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are different takes on this. Uh, I, I have my own preference. Um, I, I think you can learn a lot by doing a very simple nutrient budget for a farm. How much is coming in, and how much is going out? So, uh, if you remember the the leaky pipe, so that's the the two ends of the pipe. So you can learn so much by seeing if your, in, your outputs are not man, man, matching your inputs. It could be for a lot of different reasons. It could be because you have too much inputs in your, or your outputs are, you know, you're not getting crop production that you want. But you certainly can become aware of your productions. But you need information for this, but it's relatively simple information. So you need to have some estimate of what your production is and maybe what your nutrient analysis is. You don't necessarily need to do it all the time. You don't need to, um, you can use book values in a lot of cases. There are indicators, there are simple ways of estimating forage production with uh, 
faulty plate meters with uh, uh, alfalfa sticks. You can take, you can clip little quadrats, stick them in a microwave oven if you're careful. Don't burn it down like I did with one of our experiments. Almost burned the station down. You don't know that, Karen. Um, so, uh, so there, and then the inputs, uh, what are the inputs? So the inputs, some of it is just uh, natural deposition. There may be some uh, factors in there. Uh, and then there, if there's any inputs onto the farm, such as feed that's being purchased, feed that's being sold on the other end, being exported. So, um, and fertilizer, of course. So that's, depending on the type of operation, um, that's one strong uh, uh, way of beginning to analyze what it is. The next thing is to look at the actual practices. Where are the losses? Why, why are there losses? Can one do something about them? And so, for example, we know that, uh, I didn't get into this here, but we know that for, so that for solid manure in storage, like in uh, feeding facilities, um, solid manure systems, there's a lot of nitrogen that's lost as gas. And what that means is that the manure that's left after it's been collected from the feeding facilities is actually has very low rates of available nitrogen. The concentrations of available nitrogen are quite low. So there are two consequences. One is that the benefits of that, of that manure is more, mostly as a soil amendment. It's also a phosphor source. And if it's applied at rates that will give sufficient nitrogen response, which is what you're going to see, then the likelihood is with any manure that you're over applying phosphorus, and with this manure you'll be way over applying phosphorus. So th these various things need to be taken into account. And one needs to work with people who have some experience in developing these strategies. But I would say, for most farms, start with a simple nitrogen budget. There's so much that can be learned from that, and it's not that hard to do. Great. Uh, we've had six more questions come in, so I'll work through those. Um, so on your slide where you were talking about what happens when forage is renovated, were the nitrogen levels shown the amount that is lost or the amount that is available in the soil? What I showed was uh, definitely the amount that's available in the soil. Uh, if you were, uh, like in our case, uh, when we, uh, depending on when we renovate, if we were, had renovated in the fall in our, under our conditions, then that nitrogen would have been lost um, uh, through leaching. Uh, the same would not necessarily be true in all parts of the country where there's less, less rainfall. So, uh, but you could have a rain advance and if your soil is sandy, for example, in southern Ontario there's a lot of land like that and other places too. So uh, you can have rain events that would, that would put that nitrogen at risk. And you can also have nitrous oxide emissions, which I didn't, yeah, I did present actually that, some of that data. So that, but I didn't present it for that, sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, so you can have uh, suddenly nitrous oxide emissions. So what we found was that, um, with spraying and not when you wrote it when you tilled when when we plowed we didn't get very much nitrous oxide emission when we sprayed we got a lot of nitrous oxide emission because the soil stayed moister more, yeah it was more moist and so you need that moisture to form some nitrous oxide so I didn't get into detail but it it was just to to draw awareness to the fact that this nitrogen is there now what happens to it may be good or bad I wasn't trying to say it was necessarily bad but we should be aware that there's nitrogen in the system and when we do something we release it. So we should try to take advantage. So one of the things we don't want to do is leave the field bare for too long, for example. We want to, make, to replant it as fast as, as we can. You know, things like that. And of course it's very geographically dependent. Um, some places are much more likely uh, to have losses than other places. Great. Next question is, um wondering your thoughts that there has been a lot of focus recently on using cover crops and integrating it into the cash grain rotation. So what are your thoughts on that? So I think cover crops are great. Uh, we've, that we have done work here on cover crops. Um, it, uh, in fact, we've got a project that's just been funded to look at 
the balance uh, in, a, in a year round rotation between the summer crop and the winter cover crop. So, okay, so here I'm talking about for us cover crops and winter cover crop. I realize in some cases cover crop may be a summer uh, for uh, instead of a, a summer fallow. But in terms of winter crop, yeah, it's, uh, it's very useful. We don't have a moisture uh, situation here that I know you have in some other places. We also have very open fall and very open winter and we get uh, growth um, uh, really through most months of the year. And so to, uh, for us, a cover crop is usually a benefit all around, except that at the end, at, in the spring, it's a challenge to harvest the crop and plant your summer crop. And it actually becomes so challenging that some farmers um, will actually plow, even though they have a pretty good crop, they'll go and they'll plow it, they won't even attempt to harvest it, just so that they won't run into the, they'll do it earlier, and they won't run into this labor crunch uh, of trying to do everything and, and fit it in between rainfalls. So there's two little points, two little uh, interesting little knickknacks I'm going to mention. One is uh, that we when, we, when we looked at the cover, first of all, the best cover crop that we've come across is fall rye. In terms of, not in terms of its feed value, it's certainly not the best, but in terms of its fall growth, its persistence over the winter. Um, so if you want good cover and you're planting fairly late, we, we've not found anything that is as good as fall rye, and some varieties are better than others, actually. There are some varietal differences in terms of fall growth. And uh, another little point to consider is that the less dormancy you have in the fall, the more growth you'll get in the fall, and the better cover crop you'll get. But the other flip side is that you'll probably have less winter hardiness. So you'll have more chance of having winter kill, which may or may not be a bad thing for you, depending on how you use the cover crops. So that's uh, a consideration. So related to that point, so we looked at, and a lot of people have looked at the nitrogen uptake from the cover crop in the fall, and then looking at it again in April. And we see a whole bunch of nitrogen that's been recovered. We figure that that's been taken up throughout the winter. But when we did some wintertime sampling a year, we did it several years ago, we did some wintertime sampling, we we're quite surprised to find that actually uh, around February, and even though we, it's not so cold here, but it did freeze, we actually had a loss of some of that nitrogen that was trapped in the fall. So not all the nitrogen that was trapped in the fall that seemed to have been recovered in April actually was. Some of it was probably lost out of the cover crop, and we, if you don't sample it, you won't know it because uh, these are changes that are taking place in the middle of the, sea, in the, middle of the winter season. So it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be ignored. Now make very quickly another point. So this is uh, from our friends uh, uh, in, in, the, in the States uh, who have uh, been actually uh, they, they're funded to grow cover crops uh, in rotation with their corn. And uh, in order to get cost share with some of the programs, they need to do that. But uh, in th th this isn't a nutrient surplus situation. I realize that doesn't apply to everybody. It was an interesting point anyway. Just If nothing else, it's an interesting point. So what they found was that a lot of the farmers, like I mentioned, they, it was just too much trouble for them to harvest the crop, and they plowed it under. But they, the reason for using the cover crops is to reduce the amount of nitrogen that's being leached over the winter, which shows up in groundwater and surface water and so on. So if the cover crop that's grown is not used in those situations, are not used to replace feed coming onto the farm, then in fact they're not going to have any benefit in terms of nitrogen conservation. So what you're going to have is a surplus situation from your inputs for that year plus the extra nitrogen that you're saved from last fall, and now you're going to have it released this year. So you, this is where that nitrogen balance comes in. So if you don't improve your overall balance in this context of the whole farm, then your cover crop may be totally useless, except for erosion control. So erosion is really, erosion control, of course, can be very, very beneficial. And even with our high rainfall, another little interesting thing, in our high rainfall situation here, you would think we would never get winter time wind erosion. And actually we do, we get quite a lot of it. And what happens is soil is really wet, we get these dry winds, but it's still saturated soil. It, a gust of wind will come and it'll, draw, it'll dry about a millimeter of soil on the surface, especially where it's a little bit elevated, little mounds, 
little hummocks. And uh, then it'll dry, and the next gust of wind will pick up that soil. And this happens over and over again, and the whole sky gets absolutely filled with dust, and uh, on even though the soil is absolutely saturated. So it's another, so wind erosion, yeah, cover crops are great for that. Okay, great. Uh, next question is, on pastures, we are usually very lacking in applied nutrients. What pasture species and management thoughts make for the most soil activity in turning over nutrients for higher efficiency dry matter production? I don't think there's miracles here. Um, we, I, I think legumes are obviously very beneficial. And they're always, I mean, they're so clearly beneficial. But there's always issues with legumes. And I think one of the things that's going on with research on the prairies and other places is trying to improve, uh, to improve uh, the utilization of legumes and, the, and to overcome some of the many challenges. And I think there has been some progress. In our case, I'll just promote the fact that, it is, that we do actually have an article in the book about it. So uh, we discovered a variety that was actually uh, developed, or actually a selection that was made in so current in the 1960s, yellow, we call it yellow red alfalfa, very persistent. Um, I think uh, Grant Lestuka, if he's on this uh, call, uh, he'll vouch for that. Um, so, uh, but a problem, if it's so persistent, what seed company wants to grow the seed? Because why would they want to grow it? They'll maybe only sell the seed once to a farmer. So, an issue. Um, Size and milkfish has tremendous potential for fall grazing, but it's difficult to establish, and we need better. And I know there's some new varieties coming out of, Swift, out of uh, Lethbridge, out of, out of Surya, Charia's program, and uh, I, that's very promising. It's very nice. Uh, Same point is another one that's being developed. Uh, Burst for tree fall in the east that's been kind of languishing, but I know that Joseph uh, Papadopoulos is doing some great work with red clover, and we shouldn't forget that when you have legumes, then you have uh, maybe free nitrogen, but you don't have free phosphorus, and you don't have free sulfur. And so something might have to be done, depending on the situation, to make sure that those aren't, that the deficiency of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium in some cases, sulfur, might be the reason why the, the uh, legumes aren't staying in. But uh, that's a lot cheaper to put a little bit of those nutrients in than, to, uh, than all the nitrogen that you would need. So I guess the, the, the magical answer is to use as, as much as possible to get legumes into the system. Okay, great. Uh, so I know we're 15 minutes over time already, but there's four more great questions that I want to try to get to if we can. One is, is there less nitrogen loss in a confined feeding system using bedding versus liquid only, including transport, spreading, and potential leaching? Uh, very good question. Um, uh, I think you have losses in, in different places, but overall, uh, there, if you employ, so the thing is, there's better technology for liquid manure than there is for solid manure. So if you apply, if you have liquid manure and you apply good technology, uh, such as band spreading, uh, possibly covers, there's acidification, a bunch of things, some of them are more realistic than others, but overall, there are better techniques for managing, for reducing losses and improving the efficiency of liquid systems. Um, so, but if you are not applying good technology, maybe there isn't as much difference as one might think. So, you will get less losses in the barn, um, but some of those losses will occur when you uh, splash light the applications. Um, the emissions uh, that have been estimated uh, by um, Sean McGinn and a few others uh, from feedlots uh, in Alberta, uh, both in Lethbridge area, I think in Fort Vermillion, uh, enough for in Vermillion area. Um, they're they're, uh, they're huge. They're huge. The emissions are really high, and we need better technology to reduce those emissions so that that manure nitrogen can be put to better use. So that remains to be a, that remains a huge problem. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, there's this evidence of improvement in nitrogen utilization from the winter grazing systems. Uh, and they're not without problems, although I think they're, it's a great concept, it's great, but it's like everything else, it's not without problems and not without challenges and, we, and that system needs to be fine-tuned. 
but that's the reason that uh, even with winter feeding systems, um, uh, there, there are a lot of emissions that come from the from the feedlots. Uh, so uh, and with bedding, with all kinds of different bedding uh, applications of different bedding, it's it's really striking how high those emission rates are. Okay. Next question is: What type of nutrient losses can occur in a winter bale grazing or feed feed? Field feeding system, so winter feeding, uh, volatilization yeah. or runoff. Yeah, well, runoff and leaching. Um, there should be very little volatilization losses. Uh, the exception to that would be if you have very compacted soils, um, you know. But I don't think you'll usually have that. So I think you can pretty well figure that your emission, your gaseous emission losses, are going to be very, very low. But um, your leaching and your runoff, depending on what type of situation you're in, can be very high. In, uh, in some, part of the problem with any kind of a grazing system is the intensity of nitrogen in the urine patches. And I think that's well known that it's something like uh, 500, maybe in some cases 1,000 kilograms per hectare in those urine patches. So if you combine that with high rainfall, uh, risky soil, sandy soil situation, you can just get um, an inordinate amount of uh, leaching from those sites. And they might be hot spots also for nitrous oxide emissions, especially if the soil is fine textured. So if you have fine textured soils, then nitrous oxide becomes a bigger issue, especially with compaction. If you have coarse textured soils, it's leaching is a bigger issue. So you want to make sure that the ammonia, that the nitrogen you're saving by not having ammonia emissions isn't going to be lost to these other pathways. Remember the leaky pipe. One of the things I didn't mention about the leaky pipe, which I should have, is that if you plug one of the holes, if your inputs and your outputs stay the same, you plug one of the holes, then you'll just get more leakage coming out the other holes. And that's the point I really should have made. So if, so if you plug one of the holes, you want to make sure that you've got a better in balance between your inputs and your outputs. You, you've changed it now. So if you have less ammonia emissions, maybe spread your cows out a little bit more so they're not so concentrated in one small area, but give them a bigger area so that uh, the input-output situation. Okay, next question is, will grazing systems such as mob grazing increase leaching potential under wet conditions? Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know. I really know the answer to anything. Um, so, uh, to me, the uh, the question is, where where is the where is the nitrogen? Where is the urine going to go? You're not going to get much leaching from the from the uh, feces, but you are from the urine patches. So, if you have an extensive situation where the cows are con congregating a lot, then that's going to become a hot spot for leaching and or nitrous oxide emissions. And even possibly ammonia if you have if you have a lot of like really hard compacted soil. Um, the, this would be avoided by mob grazing. So you shouldn't have that type of situation because you're moving your water sources around, you're moving the cows around. But can we say for sure that there isn't going to be a lot of urine patches overlapping one another in these areas? Uh, or can we say for sure that there's going to be this congregation? So that's the thing I would look for is, are the urine patches going one on top of the other? The patches will be the patches, but are they going to overlap? And that's what you really want to make sure doesn't happen too much. Okay, and then our last question for you tonight, it's a bit of a long one. In the environmental farm plan, there is a calculation that estimates how much manure is produced based on how many and the kind of animals there are on the farm as compared to how much land there is. If there is a lot of land compared to livestock numbers, as in the case in this person's area with the cow-calf operations, the farmer does not have to do a nutrient management plan. This, of course, would have to assume that the farmer isn't taking all of the manure and putting it on a small area every year. What are your comments on this? Uh, several parts of that question. I don't know if I can remember them all, but um, I'll try. So, uh, yeah, there are uh, values for excretion rates. Uh, we actually, uh, in coming up with our manure numbers that I presented earlier, we actually estimated that. 
So the excretion rates for uh, nitrogen from manure, phosphorus from manure, depends on what the, cat, what, what the animals are being fed relative to their requirement. So if, for example, you're feeding a lot of legumes and because of the digest because they're digestible, you're getting a lot of energy compared to just grass. But you're also potentially overfeeding nitrogen, especially in the early part of the year. So uh, you'll be getting higher nitrogen excretion rates. And when you get higher nitrogen excretion rates, it's usually in the urine. And it's the urine that's the problem, as I kind of alluded to before. So uh, a cow is not a cow. It depends on what the, the animal is being fed. And as I said, relative to the requirement of the animal, it can vary quite a lot. So if the feed is poor uh, in terms of protein, then you're, not, you're going to have a minimum of excretion, but you'll have other issues, uh, which we'll necessarily get into. But there is an ideal amount. It's very hard to hit it dead on. Uh, so now what is the impact of that? Um, on a whole farm basis, and I mentioned the whole farm balance, then the person who asked the question uh, made reference to the right point that there is obviously less concern if you have a lot of land than if you don't have a lot of land. Here in the Fraser Valley, we don't have a lot of land. It's really expensive and nobody has a lot of it. And uh, so uh, that's always an issue, but of course in beef operations, that's often not the case. There is a lot of land. So on a simple calculation basis, it's true, why are we worried about um, nit nitrogen surpluses if the actual rate per hectare is very low? However, it's equally true that this doesn't address the question about what happens to that nitrogen. And that is extremely important and that should not be ignored. Because there would be a tendency in many cases to apply the manure as close as possible to source. Uh, it's just a cheaper way to do it, and the more moisture there is in the manure, and the rougher the land, and all kinds of factors, um, then the greater pressure is there is on the farmer to spread more and more of it uh, on the same piece of land over and over and over again. And so, yeah, you can have issues based on uh, the spatial distribution, the temporal distribution, and also, what wasn't mentioned is what, 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 what are the vulnerabilities near uh, these uh, concentrated areas? So are there water bodies? Is there a risk of, uh, is there a uh, vulnerable um, uh, water table? Um, so in Europe, and I'll just end with this point, um, they've designated an EU uh, nitrate vulnerable zones, and the NVZ about nitrate vulnerable zones. So um, every country has its nitrate vulnerable zones and nit nitrate not vulnerable zones. And some countries, like the Netherlands, Denmark, and all the low countries actually, the entire country is nitrate vulnerable. If you go to a country like Austria, none of it is nitrate vulnerable. The U UK is maybe half and half or something like that. So they have different rules for nitrate vulnerable zones and not nitrate vulnerable zones. And for nitrate vulnerable zones, there's a maximum of 170 kilograms of nitrogen that can be applied in arable crops, and I think it's like 250 or 230 for um, for uh, for perennial forages, not arable crops. And that's it; they can't go any higher. And uh, and they and that's just the rule, and they, they can't. So uh, that's taking into account. You know, it's a bit crude; it's a bit coarse but it's taken into account the impact, the potential impact. So all these things are significant. And as we go forward, we will get better and better at taking all these uh, things into account, and we'll have better technology to deal with them. You know, uh, everywhere in the world it's an issue how to better use nutrients. This is not unique to any one area, and every place has its advantages and disadvantages. And uh, I think too often a community of farmers, wherever they are, they feel really, um, they, they feel persecuted. And why wouldn't they feel persecuted? Because, you know, people are pointing their fingers and all they're trying to do is make a living and produce food. But everyone is feeling that, and at least everyone should know that everyone else is kind of feeling the same. 
And in the end, people do want to eat, and, and so we're just looking for better ways to do things, and we need to continue to work together on, on, this, uh, on these problems. Great. Yeah, it's a great note to end on. Um, so I apologize. I know there was a couple questions we didn't get to tonight. Um, Shabt, I did uh, give you his contact information, so I'm sure he would welcome those questions directly. You can try to send them in to me, and we'll do our best to get answers to you. Of course, we also encourage you to talk to your forage and extension specialists, whether they be through your provincial ministry of agriculture or your local forage council or that type of thing. So there is just a couple of quick things I wanted to mention before I let you go tonight. Um, and that's how to get more information and science-based production advice. There's a couple of free email lists that we encourage you to sign up to. The uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's uh, got an e-newsletter that you can sign up to on the website address that you see there. It's called Agri-Info. Um, and us at the Beef Cattle Research Council, you can uh, visit our website at beefresearch.ca and be sure to click on that subscribe button. And anytime we post a new article or video or other kind of decision-making tool, um, that'll show up in your email to make sure that you don't miss out on that. If you've got a Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube account, you can connect with us there too. And uh, very shortly, as soon as this webinar ends, you'll receive, um, you'll be asked to complete a short five-question survey that asks you about tonight's session and what you're most interested in for future webinars. Please do take the time to answer those five questions for us. Um, it really helps me to do the best job that I can to deliver information that's useful and meaningful to you and helps you make informed decisions on what's best uh, for your beef operation. So please do complete that and don't hesitate to contact me or uh, any of us at the BCRC with questions or comments or suggestions at any time. We really appreciate and welcome those. Uh, you will receive one more email from me, uh, like I mentioned, early next week with the link to the recording and we are also can uh, will include a few links to uh, where you can find more information on nutrient management in that email as well. And now this actually is the last BCRC webinar for a little while. We're going to kind of go on hiatus while you guys out there are in your busy uh, spring and summer seasons out in the pastures and the fields. So the next BCRC webinar won't be until October. Uh, of course, in the meantime, there's lots going on on our website and on our blog, and so um, you can uh, keep up to speed with things there as well. Um, and yeah, so that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you to all of you at home for your interest. And on behalf of everyone, thank you very much to Dr. Bittman for volunteering your time and your expertise tonight on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night.